January 12, 2010, Google released a post on their blog about a security incident, an incident that seemed like another routine cyber attack that Google faces on a daily basis quickly escalated into something much bigger due to the nature of its origins. Once the Google security team began its investigation and traced its origin, it was soon evident that a group of Chinese underground hackers were behind this operation. A group of hackers that used the university as their front and who also had close ties to the Chinese government. Once Google acknowledged this and made this information public, a series of events occurred that caused major geopolitical uproar, but more importantly, it led to Google being permanently banned in China. However, if you actually read this article, Google acknowledges the fact that they might be shut down if they go public with this information. We recognize that this may well mean having to shut down Google.cn and potentially our offices in China. So the obvious question is, why would Google do this knowingly? Why would a company with a 1.675 trillion market cap knowingly give up 12% of their market share? Is it because Google didn't agree with China's censorship policies? Or is there something that they aren't telling us? At its core, Google is not just a company. It's an embodiment of boundless possibilities that emerge when curiosity meets computers. From its iconic search engine to a range of products and services that span email, cloud computing, maps, and even the video sharing platform that you're watching this on right now, Google has seamlessly woven itself into the fabric of our daily lives throughout our entire world. Well, almost our entire world since Google is famously not available in China. This wasn't always the case as Google.cn was very active with its own dedicated team until the 30th of March 2010. Google first entered the Chinese market in the early 2000s. In 2006, Google.cn, a censored version of the search engine, was launched in an attempt to comply with the Chinese government's strict censorship laws. The Chinese version of Google search engine implemented censorship filters to exclude content that the Chinese government considered politically sensitive, socially destabilizing, or otherwise inappropriate. Certain search terms or topics such as those related to human rights, democracy, Tibet and Tiananmen Square protests of 1989 were filtered or censored to comply with government directives. And if you ask the CCP if the Tiananmen Square protests happened, it never did. There's no war in Ba Sing Se. Over the years, access to various Google services including Search, Gmail and other became sporadic in China. In 2014, Google services were officially blocked from the Chinese government and the ban became more comprehensive. Google experienced a significant cyber attack in January 2010, which came to be known as Operation Aurora. The term Operation Aurora was coined by the cybersecurity firm McAfee, which conducted an investigation into the attacks. Google publicly disclosed this incident in a blog post on January 12, 2010. So how did we get here? It all started with the attacks in 2009. These attacks were sophisticated and aimed at stealing intellectual property and sensitive information. The primary targets were companies in the United States and the attackers were suspected to have ties with China. While not all affected companies were publicly disclosed, some of the well-known ones include Google, Adobe, Juniper Networks, Rackspace, Symantec, and Dow Chemical. While specific details of the attack techniques are not always disclosed due to the sensitivity of information, here's a general overview of how they could have pulled it off. Zero day exploits. The attackers reportedly use zero day exploits which are vulnerabilities in software that are unknown to the software vendor or the public. Therefore companies like Microsoft cannot build any safeguards simply because they don't know this exploit exists. In the case of Operation Aurora, the attackers exploited vulnerabilities in Microsoft Internet Explorer to gain initial access to the targeted systems. Spear phishing. The attackers sent carefully crafted emails containing malicious attachments or links to employees within the targeted companies. These emails were designed to appear legitimate and often exploited human vulnerabilities by appearing to come from trusted sources or colleagues. Therefore, this is not the typical Nigerian prince scam email, but much more sophisticated. Watering hole attacks. In this tactic, the attackers compromise websites frequently visited by the targeted individuals or employees of the targeted companies. 
By injecting malicious code into these websites, the attackers were able to exploit vulnerabilities in visitors' browsers. Malware Deployment Once initial access was gained, the attackers deployed malware to establish a foothold within the compromised networks. The malware used in Operation Aurora was sophisticated and capable of evading detection by traditional security measures, which also included backdoor and remote access. Because the malware used in Operation Aurora typically included a backdoor component, a backdoor is a malicious program that provided unauthorized access to a compromised system. In this case, it allowed the attackers to remotely control and access the infected system. Lateral movement After gaining access, these attackers sought to move laterally within the network to escalate the privileges and gain access to sensitive systems and information. This involved navigating through the network, compromising additional systems, and maintaining persistence to continue their operations undetected. Exfiltration of data The primary goal of Operation Aurora was to steal intellectual property and sensitive information. The attackers exfiltrated valuable data including source code, business plans, and other proprietary information from the compromised systems. And finally, covering their tracks. To avoid detection, the attackers covered their tracks by erasing logs, modifying timestamps, and employing other techniques to conceal their presence within the compromised networks. So, why did they attack Google? The exact motivations behind the cyber attacks, especially those attributed to nation states, can be challenging to definitely determine. In the case of the cyber attacks on Google in 2009, the attackers were believed to have ties to China, but the Chinese government denied any involvement. When Google and McAfee conducted their research, they were able to trace the malware back to a Chinese computer college campus. Seemingly normal and definitely incapable of causing any harm to the extent of the Aurora attacks, a popular theory is that even though that this computer college might not be responsible, a state-sponsored underground base could not be ruled out. An underground base filled with Chinese hackers with the sole purpose of enacting cyber espionage and stealing intellectual property. But this is where the theory ends, as there has been no further developments on this matter. Cyber attacks often involve the theft of personal information, and in the case of Operation Aurora, access to Gmail accounts of Chinese human rights activists were compromised. This raised concern about potential state-sponsored surveillance on individuals deemed as threats to the Chinese government. Prominent human rights advocates in China, along with Tibetan rights activists in the United States, have revealed that their Gmail accounts are compromised. Their disclosure followed Google's announcement of an ongoing cyber attack targeting activists and unauthorized access to accounts, highlighting that the issue has been persistent for an extended period. Some individuals in China claimed that they had experienced repeated hacking incidents and pointed fingers at authorities. Ai Weiwei, a renowned contemporary artist in China, noticed issues with his email accounts. Ting Biao, a law professor and human rights lawyer, as well as Zhen Jinyan, an activist and wife of the imprisoned dissident Hu Jia, reported that their email accounts had been hacked as far back as 2007. The recurrence of this problem became apparent when they examined their accounts in response to Google's statement. Despite the activist's claims, a spokesperson from Chinese Foreign Ministry, Jiang Yu, stated in a Beijing press conference that Chinese laws prohibit any form of cyber attacks, including hacking. Following the Operation Aurora cyber attacks in 2009, there was diplomatic discussions and negotiations between the United States and China regarding cybersecurity issues. I raised once again our very serious concerns about growing cyber threats to American companies and American citizens. I indicated that it has to stop. Even though China and the US agreed not to spy on each other, they still spy on each other to this day. I mean, why would they stop? Espionage and intelligence activities between China and the United States have a long history. During the Cold War, both the United States and China were engaged in intelligence operations against each other, with the primary focus on ideological and strategic differences. In the 1970s, a significant shift in Sino-American relations culminating in President Richard Nixon's visit to China in 1972. This marked a new beginning in relations and increased cooperation in certain areas. But after the Cold War, the nature of intelligence activities evolved. 
Economic and technological espionage became more prominent, reflecting the growing importance of economic power. In the recent years, cyber espionage has become a major concern in Sino-American relations. Both countries have been accused of engaging in cyber attacks for economic, political, and military purposes. The ongoing trade and technological tensions in the US and China have also spilled over into the realm of intelligence. Both countries have sought to gain advantage in areas such as artificial intelligence, 5G technology, and other critical sectors. So if you were Google, would you abide by censorship laws in order to continue business in China? Or would you think about the ethics of information freedom and freedom of speech? Probably not. You would do anything in order to stay alive in China, a country with the biggest population in the world. Why wouldn't you? It's a no-brainer. So why would Google choose to pull out of China and abandon the Chinese Google office and its employees? This is where we get into conspiratorial territory. The email accounts of the human rights activists that were compromised had a third party that was interested in them. And that party was the US government. The US government had placed a court order to get access to these emails and Google was complying. And if you are China, why wouldn't you be pissed? You have an American company complying with an American government supporting human rights activities against the Chinese government. To be fair, Google has been very transparent about this. They state this on their site. Government agencies from around the world ask Google to disclose their user information. We carefully review each request to make sure that it satisfies applicable laws. If a request asks too much information, we try to narrow it. And in some cases, we object to producing any information at all. We share the number and types of requests we receive in our transparency report. And because of all this, maybe the US did not want Google to be active in China because it didn't want Google to be in a position to comply with the Chinese government and its strict policies. In the end, it's essential to recognize that intelligence activities are not unique to China and the US, and many countries engage in such practices to protect their national interests. The specifics of these operations are often shrouded in secrecy and public information is limited. The dynamic nature of international relations and evolving geopolitical landscapes continue to shape the intelligence relationship between China and the United States.